Hey, thanks for listening to today's 5-Minute Monday. This one's a little bit different. It's a little bit longer than 5 minutes. And I just want to say a couple things before we actually get into it. This is a glimpse inside depression. Depression affects different people to different extents. But if you look around you, statistically, more than 1 in 4 people are currently experiencing an episode of major depression. So when you look at somebody and you see that they're doing great, Maybe that's just on the outside. Maybe they actually need a smile and a helping hand. What happens when no one steps in? There's this myth, this unattainable 50s idea of what it's going to be like to be a mother, surrounded by a loving extended family who fawn over the new baby and you. You're told people will bring you meals and help out, and that you will have more help than you want and that you will wish that people would leave you alone. The truth, in my experience, is nothing like the televised media fantasy. The truth is, you're alone. Even with a partner at your side, you are alone. The truth for me lies in this darkness, this all-consuming emptiness. It's in the complete loss of self, a destructive loss of confidence, of what little confidence you gained after making it through high school, It's the loss of something you thought you could never lose. For me, motherhood is gray, with flashes of the most intense bright light you can imagine that lifts you up higher than you ever thought possible, feeling joy beyond anything you previously experienced. It's a feeling of connectedness that you've never experienced with another human, only to suddenly feel it plummet into darkness, completely devoid of light, so intensely dark that you can feel it. It presses on you. It consumes you. Aggressively shouts in your ear, you're not enough. You'll never be enough. They deserve better than you. You failed. It's an all-consuming numbness that somehow you have to push through, breathe through, and love through. I've read the mothering books and the parenting books that talk about building your community, having your family there to support you. I've had so many people say, I couldn't have done it without so-and-so. I don't have that. Don't get me wrong, we have family, but not that kind of family. Not the kind that I was expecting from the books and TV shows. Our family doesn't step in. They don't fawn over our babies. Well, not privately. There's definitely a public display of affection. And there's talking about all the things that they do for us and how much they love their grandchildren to other people. The truth is, we don't see that. And then there's toxic perfectionism surrounding parenthood and child rearing, to the point of shaming and alienating parents and children who aren't perfect. My first pregnancy was picture perfect right up until his premature birth at 30 weeks. For any mom who's been through the premature stage, my heart goes out to you. It nearly broke me. And it has honestly taken me 13 years to realize just how much damage was done. He was our first baby, the one we'd waited for. I was doing everything right. Taking my vitamins, getting exercise, talking to my belly, singing to my belly, playing music to my belly, eating organic healthy foods, planning for the perfect natural birth. But as I'm sure many of you all know, You can make all the plans you want, but it's the baby who decides what happens. And that's the terrifying part. I don't think there's any way to explain to someone who hasn't had a little human inside them controlling every aspect of their life. Bladder control? I had that down. Never had an issue after two years old. Food choices? I was good. Smells? Body aches and pains? Right down to the ability to tie my shoes. It all goes. You are being controlled from the inside out by someone you have never met. You lose your way before that baby ever makes its appearance. For me, that first meeting was heart-wrenchingly terrifying. And I have honestly felt like a failure since that first doctor came to my recovery room, where I sat alone in my bed, feeling numb, playing what I had just had happen over and over again. What had I done wrong? Was he going to be okay? 
I never got to hold him. Would I ever get to hold him? I never got to see him. What did he look like? Where was he? What was happening? Was he going to make it? Would he make it? I was a wreck, in tears. My husband, who had not left my side for the five days in the hospital previous, was allowed to go and see him. I was not. And in that dark time, alone, the pediatric doctor came in to see me. Expressionless, he told me that our son's eyes looked oddly spaced and that he would most likely be facing a life of many complications and delayed developments because he had been born too early. I carry that guilt with me every single day. Every single special appointment for his kidneys. Every parent-teacher conference where instead of addressing concerns we were told, he'll catch up, it's just because he was born so early. A knife to my heart every time. My self-esteem would plummet further. I felt worthless, a failure, watching my child struggle and not knowing what to do. Eventually, we built up the courage to try for another baby, only to face years of infertility, of cutting remarks from family in tears and heartaches, believing even more that everything really is all my fault. Then, miraculously, after seven years, we got another precious baby. Things were going well. Well, until we were evacuated for a forest fire at seven months pregnant. Family support decreases. You cry a lot. Birth plan goes out the window when you have to deliver in a hospital that no longer delivers babies because she's coming too fast. So you don't even have an accurate birth weight on your little new one because they don't know. You live on a farm. You're close to parents this time, hoping that it's going to be different than that first scary time. You're wrong. The isolation increases. Now we're parents to a teenager a five-year-old, and our third blessing, a two-year-old. It's hard. And now I don't work. I don't teach anymore. I'm at home. I'm homeschooling because that's what our kids need. But it's more isolating than ever. And because I'm a teacher, people think homeschooling is going to be easy. It must be so easy for me. I hear that all the time. Newsflash, it's not. Your own kids are a different ballgame. Daily, I fight the what if I fail? What if I can't help them with everything they need? What if? What if? What if? I play it over and over again in my mind. I don't sleep. I keep hearing it takes a community to raise a child. What if you don't have a community? What do you do? The advice I've heard, take time for yourself. Put on your own mask first. That kind of well-meaning, we made it through, so can you advice. It makes me want to punch someone in the face. Honestly, I feel like I lost my mask so long ago and I haven't been breathing for a while. And that that me that I thought I knew died a long time ago, but facing each day and show I show up, a sleep-deprived, emotionally scarred zombie, just trying to make it through to bedtime. Where I long for connection, but know that I'll be touched out and grumpy and that my husband will be working on his master's, and that our teenage son will be up really late, and the cycle will start again. I'm broken. I don't even have the foggiest clue of who I am, or what I want, how we got here, or how we're going to make it through. We live in a semi-rural town. If you're not from here, you don't fit. If you don't like basketball, you really don't fit. They aren't going to make room for you. Bonds were formed long before you came, and you aren't going to be part of their group. I find myself becoming increasingly more like a hermit, staying home, caring less and less about what I look like, avoiding going to community activities. People say, but you need to put yourself out there. Try, get involved, lose yourself in the service of others. You can't give what you don't have. An empty well is just that, empty. What little water I have left goes to my kids. Money's tight. There's no spa days, no therapy sessions, no retail therapy, and no date nights. It's an uphill in the snow both ways, slog in a blinding blizzard, realizing that night is about to fall. It's deeper, darker fear, 
heightened by a worldwide pandemic and an ever-present friend anxiety. I push people away to keep from being hurt or seeing my kids hurt. My days are wrapped up in guilt, shame, and overwhelm, sprinkled with self-loathing and a dash of childhood trauma. The thing is, I want to break this. I want to be present for my kids, to be there for them, not just now, but in the future. I want them to be comfortable asking for my help and for us to have a relationship based on love, trust, and mutual respect. I want my kids to call me when they have highs and lows. I want to be there for my girls when they have babies, to clean their house while they hold their newborn baby and bond and connect. I want them to have a freezer filled with their favorite mom meals and know that they can call me at two in the morning to get through those first horribly painful feedings. I want to feel closer to my husband, not feel like he's growing and changing and I'm lost in my pit of despair. I want to know who I am so that I can help my children learn who they are. I want to feel capable of not having to please everyone. I want to be able to tell my parents how they hurt me and that I don't want them to do the same to my children. I want to feel important. I want to feel seen, heard, understood. But mostly, I want to feel. I want the numbness to go away and I want to stop being afraid to feel. I want to thank my wife for sharing a personal thing like that. She wrote that after a creative writing session that she does occasionally as a self-care to deal with her own mental health. It's not a cry for help or a complaint on her part or my part, but it's an acknowledgement that everybody experiences depression and anxiety in different ways. So I hope it meant something to you and helps you have a little bit more compassion for those around you who may be suffering with some sort of mental health condition that you are aware of or maybe you're not aware of. Remember that one in four of us is probably dealing with something right now. So thank you for listening. It'd really mean a lot if you would share the podcast and maybe go leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Apparently that helps. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to send an email to questions at workshoptherapypodcast.com. Or if you have your own story to share, please record it and send it on and I will get it into the podcast. Thank you for listening again. I just want to say thank you to the founding members of the Workshop Therapy Patreon family. Eric of Overall Maker Works. Keith Drennan of Blackthorn Concepts, Brad of Brad's Customs, Matthew Serio from Artiano Serio, and C. Grant Alexander. If you want to join on Patreon to support the show or just say thank you, I'd appreciate it.